accompanied the Moffitt Roxbury Board of School Directors meeting uh, on the balmy June 19th at 634. Um, oh, at, do you happy Juneteenth? Sure. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. Yes. I noticed, I heard that there was some learnings about it in the middle school, which seemed great. Excellent. Um, was it like all school assembly about it today? And William learned about it in his classroom last week. So very, very cool. Very cool. Obviously, lots of lots of work still left to do on that front, but I thought that was nice. Nice to see. Awesome. And happy Juneteenth, everyone. And just add one quick thing to the agenda. There are some questions about the um, the decision to uh, change the school schedule at the end of the year, given the heat, and just some kind of board questions about um, how that worked. Uh, and so just put a little time for Libby to explain that. Um, so first order of business is public comment. Uh, that's where we listen to members of the public. We do not respond in real time, but uh, the feedback that we get is uh, something we take very seriously uh, and we uh, either incorporate it into our decision-making process or if it's appropriate, we try to find ways to address whatever concerns are, are brought to us. So um, I don't know if we have anyone in the room. Looks like maybe Jim. Yeah. Hey folks, uh, Jim Eikenberry, Montpelier resident. Happy to be here on this uh, balmy evening. Um, <clears throat> I emailed you all. You could tell I had the day off and I was caught up on house projects. Uh, so I'm not gonna repeat anything that was in that email. Appreciate whenever it gets cooler and you've got a moment to think to share thoughts and responses on what I emailed today. So unsurprisingly here, I'm gonna talk about track. <clears throat> and so, um, I noticed that the Facilities Energy Committee meeting hasn't met in a while and didn't know if you heard any updates from Andrew in a bit, so I'll give them to you as sort of a public comment. Uh, track in the middle school and the high school this year is the largest team in spring sports. It was combined last year, the largest team. This year, individually, the high school team is larger than Ultimate Frisbee, and in the middle school, the, the middle school team is shockingly larger than any of the other sports, and sometimes all of them combined. So... Um, 145 uh, students in our district were working with us volunteer coaches and participating in the track program, which was a great experience. And I was a coach for this time. I um, want to show appreciation to Andrew, Tom, Matt, and Jason for working with me and Nathan over a multi-month process of finding uh, understanding and common ground and acceptance with budget realities to try to get to where the board asked us to get to a while ago on getting the facility safe and functional. Um, we're gonna get some quotes um, back from contractors and hear updates from Andrew next Tuesday. Hopefully we're on track, pun intended, to have some stuff happen this summer if the numbers worked out. They might not work out, we'll see. Um, but I think good things are happening and check in with Andrew for more. Um, I do hope as I look at the master facilities report and see realignment of things and some future magical plan where somebody gives us $110 million um, that the track shifts and other things shift. So hopefully um, any track renovation could be considered in part of any future large school projects. And also there is an opportunity for land and water conservation fund to see about getting funds to help do renovation on the track and or other facilities that we need here at the school. So I'll get, continue to engage with you all and there's a October application deadline for that. So again, when the weather gets a little cooler, we'll talk more and see what we can do to keep improving our facilities for um, our awesome track stars. Thanks y'all. Awesome, thanks Jim. Uh, anyone online uh, for public comment? Looks like not. Um, uh, let's do the consent agenda. Do I have a, and just for the benefit of newcomers, the consent agenda is where we approve um, kind of pro forma items like minutes of former meetings, uh, superintendent's reports, uh, you know, contracts, new hires, resignations, et cetera. Um, if anyone wants to ask questions or pull something off for discussion, they can. Uh, but it's a time-saving device. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? 
I move we approve the consent agenda. Do have a second. second. Any questions or discussion? Questions about them earlier? And I was just kind of curious how the process works for those who don't have a problem with the authorization. Just kind of curious about it. Um, we can definitely have, yeah, uh, Briz, yeah, we can definitely talk about it. I don't know if we, we need to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And keep it in the consent. Yeah. Do you want to ask your questions for me yeah. so that they're on record? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so how many firms did we have bid on these contracts and why were they the winning bids? So um, I forwarded your questions to Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, he pub we publicly advertised the roof project. We had three contractors attend the walkthrough. Mm -hmm. um, only one actually bid Got it. on the project and the bid amount was reasonable. Mm -hmm. We did have a public opening of those bids as well. It's not advertised as a board meeting because it's not a board meeting, but right. we did advertise for the, the opening of the bids. So that was the roof one, but aren't there two? There's also, isn't there a second one? Switches. The switches. I'm not sure. Andrew didn't give me any information oh, about the okay. switches. I don't know. That was the electrical closet relocation. That's the Benoit electric. Uh, we use Benoit for almost okay. everything. Okay. So, <laughs> so that would be. That's that right? that yes. Yes, insurance is paying for it. I just wasn't sure if that one followed the same process. I don't know. I couldn't answer that. I'm not okay. sure. And well, then, I can certainly find out though. And then when it comes to the roof project, I saw that it's coming from capital funds. Um, does that use up all of the capital funds we were planning on spending this year? Uh, so we should have two hundred to 300000 and left in the capital fund after the after, roof okay. project. Um, the next priority will be dependent on if we decide if the board decides to add to the capital fund the next budget year uh -huh. or not. That's a big question. Right. The projects to consider is the remainder of this MHS roof, the start of the UES MSMS windows, or just hold it for emergency or future funding. Uh -huh. um, so that's the kind of thing. The thing that we found out when the roofers came to look at the cafeteria roof, uh -huh. um, Andrew had them checked the theater roof. Oh, good. And at the same time. Uh -huh. And what was happening is that water was some, now this is my layman's understanding uh -huh. of it. So please take that. <laughs> I, sure. could, I could be slightly inaccurate. There's water getting under the roof over the auditorium, but it was holding in between the two, okay. um, like the ceiling and the roof, okay. like yeah. somewhere in there. Okay. And so um, right now it was able to dry without mold, but there was a worry that that eventually would would get a, to be a bigger problem and have mold. Right. Um, okay. And so he, he made the he made the executive decision to fix that. So both are getting done. Yes. Okay. And just so I understand, when you say there's about two hundred ish left after this project, there's nothing that we're planning on spending that money on right now. The so, windows would probably be the yes, next in line. That's yeah. where I was kind of going. Was we've been talking about it. Yeah, improving those for a long time. Forever. Yes. Um, okay. And then do we have any ESSER money left? And if there's so ESSER so money the needs project? to be spent by September, right. September one or some sometime in September. Yeah. And we're converting the um there's a special education suite at UES um, on the second floor as part that was part of the renovation in the 80s. Um, and right now the middle part of that suite is almost unusual. It's like, it's strangely blocked off. There's lots of storage things there. And we're opening that area to be more kid-friendly mm -hmm. in a student support space. Um, the MSMS kitchen and cafe cafeteria renovations are happening this summer. Um, there's site improvements to retaining walls. We're adding drainage and ground surface to the outdoor eating area at MSMS. And if we have money left over, we will look into new play equipment over there. I was really hoping you would say that. So I'm hoping there's money left over. We've Fingers crossed. Asking, people asking for yeah. better play. Fingers crossed. Oh, absolutely. Time. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay. So that's the ESSER work that's happening this summer. Okay. All right. And that will be the end of the, like, we'll have spent all of ESSER. Right. Which yeah. we want to do. Yeah. Did that answer your questions, Tim? I think mostly it, the big thing I just was asking was there was a public bid for both of these contracts. And it sounds like there is for there's, the ESSER project is you know, for the two that we're approving uh, today. The contracts we're approving. Oh, today. I don't know about the switches. This, okay. Andrew didn't reference those. The roofs there were. The roofs there were. And is this work? This work's getting done in the summer. Mm -hmm. all, like all of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. 
it starts literally Friday. <laughs> Might as well. It's a short season. Yeah. And we'll be yeah. very grateful yeah. for yeah. them to be up on a roof in this heat. Two months. Mm -hmm. uh, I Wait, hope this is will be. Probably cool. breaks. Yeah. Yeah. Just break. Uh, answer your questions better. Um, any other questions or comments about the consent agenda? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, do you want to do a quick discussion before we jump into the board discussion just about the closing before we I would rather have my crew go speak so that they can go home. All right, perfect. All right, let's do it that way then. Um, yeah, so really excited to hear this discussion about spring assessment data. Um, thank you, Mike, Jess, Peggy Sue, and Nick for covering out some time on this hot evening and on Juneteenth to come talk to us. Um, I don't know, whoever wants to start off, uh, go ahead. So we really uh, got you with the report and just wanted to give a chance to speak to any questions, answer any more detail that we can. Um, I can go first or we can all try and fit at this table, which would be really um, cool. <laughs> yeah. Feel free to spread out. I know that you switch it. I want to submit. It's it. not. <laughs> It's not great weather for being <laughs> super cozy. I'll get a load of time. <laughs> so, Mike, do you want to just hit the uh, highlights since you're up first in the data report? Sure. So. Some highlights to walk through. Um, we saw improvement from the spring of last year to the spring of this year in our RENSTAR reading, and there were some particular uh, interesting points. So one of the, the challenges with Renaissance star data is that from fall to winter and winter to spring is it's not an apples to apples comparison for a lot of reasons. Uh, for example, at the elementary school, we had 13 students move out and 13 students move in between the winter testing and the spring testing. But on top of that, we had a wonderful problem um, where we had 54 more students tested in the spring than we did in the winter. And these were students that had previously been tested in the early literacy assessment, which is a lower level assessment below the reading assessment. So what that means is that those students made enough progress that they could not be tested in that lower level and needed to move into the reading assessment. And that skewed our spring data quite a bit, um, but that's a wonderful problem to have, to have 54 students that are advancing into that level of assessment. Um, so it was a, a great thing. And we still, from spring to spring, showed improvement across all the grade levels. Um, the really thrilling geek out moment was the uh, words their way spelling assessment. Looking at the results from fall to spring was just incredible and redeeming for those elementary educators that have been working so hard on, on literacy instruction. Um, you know, for example, in first grade in the fall, we had 8% of our students at or above proficiency on that end of year benchmark. And in the spring, we had 81%. Um, that's significant. And the data from the, the words their way um, assessment is something that we all kind of geek out about. It's really descriptive, really helpful, and helps us identify very specific goals and targets for students. So, so that was exciting to see. And then in Renaissance Star Math, we saw improvement from spring to spring again. Um, we want to see those get a little higher. Uh, math is going to be a focus for us moving forward as well. But that's still good growth, and we're pretty happy with that. questions for Mike specifically on the academic data. One question just out of, out of this, when you look at fall and spring assessments, is that, are you assessing at a fall level versus a spring level? It's the same level that's being. Okay. End of your benchmark for words their way. Okay. Yeah. So we wouldn't necessarily expect it to be a very high number in the fall. 8% maybe it was lower than you wanted or yep. we would want, but if it's where they, we want first graders to be at the end of the year and it's yep. the beginning of the year, then yep. we know we have plenty of time with them. To, to have 81% of our first graders at or above proficient on that assessment is, is great. That's really great. And if you look in the report, you can 
you can almost see the statistics march from left to right from fall to winter to spring and it, it's really exciting mm -hmm. uh, it's great i have lots of questions about how to read this report so yeah. keep asking them. Nice. <laughs> because there's so much here it's hard to wrap your head around well, i guess the one other on that point is what do you expect then next year so when you take the you know it's eight percent in the let's take the first grade eight percent it's 81 when you're looking at second grade next year does that mean you're looking at like higher than eight percent number or does that do you track it like that like how it'll be like interesting for us to over? see so there, there's different developmental expectations at each grade level you know first graders have a lot more that they're going to pick up and learn in that first year than say a fourth grader or fifth grader those percentages get smaller as you can see right. But what we saw there was some really strong evidence that what we're doing instructionally is making a difference for students. Um, this data for teachers in particular is very detailed in what aspects each student needs to be able to move to the next level. So it's really helpful with instruction and that's what we hope to see. And now that we've done this for a year and we've implemented the work through letters and we're doing those things, as those student cohorts move up, they're gonna continue to be in a better place and continue to be able to build upon that. So we're, we're really genuinely excited. You know, Rachel and MC, when they were here last time, really talked about that and just seeing that progression go up and up and up and students be better prepared for each grade level as we go on up. Thank you. Other questions? Are they kind of yeah. yeah. Um, I am interested to know, like we, it still looks like there's not that many kids testing in the Renstar early literacy. Is that, I can't remember. I know that we've asked this question before and you've given an answer and yes. I just can't remember what it is. And so it, it is strange to look at it and say, oh, well, you'd expect that number to be higher, but maybe it shouldn't be. Yeah. It, so we don't test our kindergartners in the fall. You know, for whatever reason, we have some sympathy for them. You know, <laughs> they're five, but come on, let's not play a game. Um, so that number, you know, there's, there's a lower number for the fall. We do, um, depending on some of our ML students, we, some ML students take that assessment as well. So, but that could change from fall to winter and winter to spring. And that's kind of the deceptive thing about the Renaissance star numbers is that there's so many cohort shifts as the year goes on, you're not seeing an apples to apples to apples comparison from one Got it. time to the other. Um, and so there's, kind of three layers for the early literacy assessment. One is uh, grade level. So kindergarten tends to take the early literacy. Sometimes first graders in the fall take it, but then there's a, a benchmark number that if they get passed, they move into the reading. Okay, for so us, they wouldn't get tested, I see. That's right, so they, they move into the reading and typically when they move into the full reading, they're at the lower end of that range because they've just moved there. But for us to have 54 students take it in the spring shows phenomenal growth mm -hmm. and, a, and a great thing. So, yeah. but it's not, um, it's, it's kind of a a la carte assessment that we use for students in particular situations. Got it, got it. Um, I also wanted to ask about the math foundational skills assessment. That was the one that yep. where um, lots of numbers. Yeah. It looks like in some of the skills the numbers are kind of all over the place. Like yep. they're strong in the fall, but then they're the same skill, they're weaker in the spring. Can you, yeah. why would that be? So this assessment we're actually redoing with teachers over the summer and it's gonna become a formative assessment for their unit planning. So the way that this is used by the teachers at the middle school is they give it prior to a unit of instruction to see a student's levels going into that unit. Uh -huh. But what happens is when you take rounding, the fall question is less rigorous than the winter question, uh -huh. which is less rigorous than the spring question. They go up in levels. So for this is particularly true in areas like fractions and fractional knowledge and those things. So that, that's why you see these numbers go up and down. This isn't a linear, how are students achieving mm -hmm. a benchmark at the end of the year assessment. This is something our teachers use to inform their instruction going into the fraction unit in the spring yeah. versus the fall. So that's why the numbers go up and down. And we're going to be redoing this, this assessment this summer, breaking it into particular pre-unit assessments to inform instruction. So you probably won't see it on a data report just because it kind of gives the impression of it, achievement levels, and it's not that. Right. It's to inform instruction. That's helpful. Yeah. Very helpful context. Thank you. Um, then my last question on academics is just um, 
how, maybe it's what assessments do you use or how do you, how are we best kind of catching when a kiddo is struggling um, so that, you know, we can in do the interventions we need or maybe even is that an early sign that we should be doing further assessment for say a learning disability? So we've, we've done really well this year and that's, that's due largely to the efforts of the educators in identifying diagnostic tools for us to be using. We have different layers. So we have Renaissance star, which is a screener that kind of says, Hey, you might want to look here. Right. And then we have a layer below that with the words, their way assessment and a couple other tools that we use the running record, you know, fluency checks, things like that, that give us a little bit more information. And then we get down to a really granular level with a bunch of diagnostic assessments to really determine what students need and what they don't need. A big focus for us next year is looking at diagnostics and mathematics, where there's not as many to choose from, and, but we are focusing in on the PNOA the OGAP and another one from New Zealand that we piloted this spring to see if we can get that same level of detail that we have in literacy in mathematics. But our educators have done a really great job, particularly our interventionists and our special educators this year, identifying resources to, um, to provide that information. It's great to hear. Yeah. Thank you. And congratulations on how the, in the instruction is improving, Thank especially you. in literacy. Other questions? Yeah, so um, first I just want to ask about the demographic information. Um, if we're thinking about making demographic pro projections into the future, I assume that the um, UES preschool numbers are not indicative of what we would expect for enrollments in the right? Because there's like, kids are considerably lower in the negative one and negative two categories than, than kindergarten. Um, these numbers include partnerships at the preschool level, so okay. students that aren't necessarily in our schools but are participating in the 10 hours per week. Yeah, so is that, does that indicate that we are looking at a huge drop-off in enrollment in the next few years? I do not believe so. Okay. I, I would not use these numbers gotcha. to do that. I would okay. look at birth rate and census likely, um, but the preschool numbers are a little squishy because of the partnership component, because there's lots of kids mm -hmm that don't participate in the partnership that aren't included in these numbers. Mm -hmm. So then really it's basically the, 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 the data that we're really um, comfortable with start at the kindergarten level, the grade mm -hmm. zero up. And the, I mean, that still shows the same demographic trend, just not so much. Perfect. I just want to double check it. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, and then I'm going to check my assumption, but the RBS literacy like explosion, I assume that has at least something to do with Shannon Miller. Um, and so I just, yeah, that when I saw that, I was like, wow, that, I mean, that's almost 30 point uh, increase. Um, that's awesome. Um, and then I just want to, the, the proficiency numbers for the Renstar that we're looking at, mm -hmm. um, what, what is, th does everyone in Vermont take, all of the schools of Vermont take these? And so the, the reason I ask is I'm kind of like, where are we when we look at ourselves relative to here institutions. I don't have comparative Renaissance star data for other schools in Vermont. Okay. It's not uh, publicly available. So. so we really only can compare ourselves to our previous year's data? With Renaissance star, with VT cap, we compare it to the state. And we're always above. Um, I think that's it. Any other questions? Anything on the? Great, thanks, Mike. Test for um, like this is sort of a proficiency-based testing, and really important. How do we test to show that we're sort of pushing our students to excel? You know what I mean? Like, how, yeah. Is there a is there some kind of Actually, Peggy Sue is going to talk about it with some dots in a little bit. But <laughs> we've been, um, we've really, so I would say this um, without patting ourselves on the back, we spent a lot of time this year really understanding data literacy from a district level, a school level, a classroom level. And we have some pretty exciting things that we found 
One of those is the student growth percentile. So we've started really looking deeply at data to see the rate at which a student is growing, particularly if you have a student that is below grade level, they have to grow at the average speed and then some compared to their peers. Otherwise, they're just going to move at below grade level their entire time here. So we now have tools to be able to look at student growth percentage and see, are they responding to our instruction? Or are they responding to our intervention and remediation at a rate that is going to help them get to grade level? And so we've really, really started to move from kind of this linear data that you see here to this and supporting conversations with teams and classroom teachers. Because if you see a student who is at a lower growth but a higher achievement, that's as much of an issue as someone that's at a higher growth and lower achievement or higher growth and higher achievement. So we have a way now to really have these conversations and see if what we're doing is working at an individual level. It's pretty exciting. So, so lower growth but high, higher achievement would be a kiddo who is proficient but just staying there. That's right. Yeah. Who is an example of that. Yeah. Right. right. And what you're saying is we want teachers to be looking at that and going, hmm, am I really challenging that kiddo enough? Exactly. Got it. Yep. But we also want to see, I'll just do do this for Peggy Sue. You shouldn't have to talk. We want to see our intervention students in this quadrant where they are past the average growth rate. So the, if the average growth rate is in the middle here, we want to see them on this side, that they're growing faster than the average. Maybe they don't have the high achievement yet, but they're getting there and their rate of growth is faster than average. So that means that they're catching up quicker. So it's pretty, it's pretty exciting stuff. And, and Peggy, Sue and I are excited to really spend some time connecting special educators and interventionists around this data to see how our, our, interventions and remediation are working. And I assume you want that like across the board where you're like mm -hmm. higher achieving, higher growth students, stay higher growth. You just gotta be like, okay, you know, Bobby's doing great. We can focus on these other people. Well, it's, but it's also students that need enrichment. We can identify them in this as well, but it's, this is more formative, immediately actionable data for teachers that we can be really responsive to. For anybody watching at home, the graph that Mike was showing Sorry. us is on page 10 of the report if you want to find it. Sorry. <laughs> and the colors mean nothing, just to be clear. They're just the stickers I have. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good segue, I think, for me. Um, the nice thing for the classroom teachers is that they can look at this by their classroom. There's no way on Friends Star to pull out individual students. So that is why I sat down with paper and stickers and had to go through every class and pull out the individual students. So um, what I did is I looked at it by math and reading and then or literacy, and then I looked at it by school, and then I did it also by case manager. So the case manager ones actually have a splash down, but um, they have the students' individuals uh, initials so that they're able to look at where their individual students are and then also look at are there trends. So for example, what we saw, which wasn't really a surprise, but is that we are seeing more growth with reading and literacy than math. And I think that some of that comes from we put a lot of training and effort into that. So it's working, which is great. And I think that's also um, many special educators, that's really where they just feel comfortable and focused and there's more training. And so part of that was really helping us see, yep, math is now where we need to look at next year because our trends weren't as necessarily as strong for math as they were for reading. Mm -hmm. um, but this was, I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it took a while <laughs> because it literally is having to go through and be like, oh, wait, that's a name I recognize. That's a summer space load, it, you know. Um, but it's worth it because it, it does provide very colorful, although again, the colors mean nothing, but just really good information for us to look at. So just a clarification, the first yep. sheet you're showing us there is all of the middle school, is it? So this is the middle school for reading, Uh huh. yes. Yep. Kid, kiddos who are so getting these are students with IEPs. Yep. Um, some of this is this doesn't necessarily mean they have a reading intervention either. So there are other things that I can dig deeper. This was just an initial like, yeah. let's see what this looks like. Um, but yeah, so this is all of the students with IEPs in the middle school and where they fell on their when they're starting. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, so that, I mean, that, that, so then I was able to meet with individual um, teachers and, or case managers and special educators and look at the kids on their caseloads and talk about, you know, where are the, where are the areas that we need to focus and that kind of stuff. So that will be part of the summer project is looking at kind of how the year ended. Um, as far as my other things, I shared just some highlights. I think, um, as I said, it's hard to look at just numbers when you look at students with IEPs because if we don't look there, a small thing can be a big thing. And so um, I asked people to share some of their highlights with me and make sure that I did them in a way that it wasn't identifiable. Um, but um, we've seen some really exciting growth with individual students this year. Uh, thinking about next year, um, we are talking about intentional collaboration more with the interventionists and the SEL providers. Um, because we've built this great system, but our system needs to now make sure that we are intentionally collaborating and we're not finding ourselves siloing by the fact that we have more supports in place. So we're looking at scheduling um, and making sure that we are really intentional in talking about kids in all of those places. Um, the numbers, uh, just the child count number, uh, this graph, our child count has gone up pretty significantly. So. Every December 1st, we have to turn in our child count to the Vermont Agency of Ed. Last year, it was 139, and this year, it was 173. So that's, sorry, child count is the number of students pre-K to 12 with IEPs. So that's a pretty significant um, increase. So appreciate our special educators. We don't got any more. <laughs> a lot more kids are working with. Um, we, as you can see in these numbers, we're increasing um, our, we've increased in our um, number of IEPs just in the school year. Um, at, at the pre-K level as well as K-12, and we've increased in our number of students with 504 plans. Uh, but I did include that national information here um, and the AOE information, um, or the Vermont information, just to, to see how we compare. So right now, in our district, 16% of students have IEPs. National average, the most recent one available was for 22-23, that was 15%. So we're a little above average, but in Vermont, 18%. Um, according to the Office of Special Ed Programming, the federal office. So, um, you know, we're in the range, I would say, of where everyone else is. And God bless Lindsay and Suzanne. They did so many evaluations this year. So they did 45 initial special ed evaluations, and I believe 34 re-evaluations. So we are getting our money and a lot more out of having our own school psychologist. Um, and I feel like she's been a really positive um, addition to our district. I feel like families are getting a lot more information. She's really able to uh, articulate it and help families understand what her testing is showing. Um, and yeah, we, we did a lot of evaluations. So that's what I have. I don't know if there are other information that people have questions about. Questions? I have a couple. The increase in the number of people on IPs, and is that, like, how do we assess that? What's behind that? Is that because we're doing a better job of identifying? Is that because we're not giving support until they fall through the place where they need an IP? Is it, is it a good indicator? I think, indicator? A, I think one is that indicator? as we um, continue to get better with data and we're just having systems that are catching kids that we are, um, yeah, we're doing more evaluations. We also had a pretty significant change in the special ed regulations. And I think that has been a, huge, a big part of the increase. Yeah. And our, I mean, you noted that we have not added special educators. Right. Um, and I know that money is not flush, but is right. that, um, are you feeling that your current special I was going to say, I need to fill a position yeah. right now. Um, you know, I, we, I think that one of the things that's nice with Act 173 is that we can collaborate um, with the interventionists, and we also did, um, you know, add a couple SEL professionals that are working with students with IEP. So some of the services that might have been provided by special educators are, you know, being able to be provided elsewhere. And I think we have to pay close attention that we then don't take over the intervention system with specialized services that because then we're undermining our whole system. So, um, but right now, if anyone out there knows special education, we have an opening still in those so that we can fill. So, um, you know, I think it's one of those things that even if we had it, I'm not sure we can yeah. find somebody. 
So be nice to the ones we have, please, because we want to keep them. because they're great. So more of a budget question. Isn't it the case that we have full reimbursement from the state, or I'm not, okay, I'm not remembering that correctly. It, they changed with F-173. I see. It's, yeah, it's changed now. Okay. Never mind. Other questions for Peggy Sue? Yeah. A couple. Well, first, I wanted to say thank you because I know that you've yeah. been doing a lot of work to help demonstrate our system at a systems level when it's literally individual <laughs> education plans. So I know that that's um, from our my request, and I think yeah. that's. Um, I just wanted to say I appreciate that. So appreciate Mike because he was the one who found it. <laughs> I well, I appreciate all of you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, and then when you were here a few weeks ago talking about the things that the district has been doing in response to the special ed audit, we, you mentioned some of the things that we're, you're, we're doing in response to the, the like family co like partnership part of it. And can you speak to any of the result of that work that you've been doing this year? Like how that's going with the, the family piece? Um, so I think that, um, it's an individual thing. And so, um, I think that also is individual, um, you know, we did a handbook this year and I'm not sure how many people have accessed that, you know, I try to like remind people that it's there. Um, you know, certainly, um, I think more of the work that we've done has been done by individuals. Um, you know, the caregiver council, we don't have anyone right now. I, um, that has a student for the plan. So that hasn't been the focus there, um, but I think that that's part of what we need to keep figuring out is how to um, provide people the opportunity to ask questions and share their um, thoughts and have input um, when it's not necessarily just about their child at the moment where it feels. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I also recall you in one of these other conversations that we've had when you've come and presented, talking a lot about, especially when you first started um, back up or started with us, yep. talking a lot about building up trust. And can you speak to that at all? I'm obviously at a system, yeah. more of a systems level sure. than an individual level, yeah. but I know that was, has been a focus of yours. So is yeah. there um, any update you can give us? It, it varies. You know, I mm -hmm. think that um, there are some families that had, and right or wrong, I was here, but um, really feel like they are the school district has not provided what they need and or their child needs, and so um, I think that's like the long haul, right, to kind of get them to a place to trust what we're presenting to, you know, um, when we're providing the data to believe that data, um, to know that the professionals that are working with their kids want and are doing what they can based on their instruction. Um, so I would say in a lot of ways, I think that um, some of the families that, um, I don't know, some of the families that maybe were not feeling as trustworthy have certainly gained that. And part of that is also trying to keep them with consistent case managers so that they're, you know, those relationships um, and I think that there's some people feel like there's a long, it's going to be a lot, and I'm not sure, other than just continuing to be open around communication um, and trying to answer their questions um, and find that balance of really what we want to do is spend our time working with the kids and not spend all their time proving to the parents that we're working with. Mm. So I would say it's a big thing. Got it. Okay. Thanks for the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Good, thank you. No, yes. very helpful. All right, I'm up. Um, so as I was going through the data and looking it over, um, one of the stories that sort of told me is that we've really improved our ability to support students with higher social emotional learning needs. Um, our suspension rates are down, which is fantastic, um, right? Suspension is really exclusionary and leads to really negative outcomes. So for me, that's a huge deal um, that I'm really proud of, um, our system being able to do that. Our rates of hazing, harassment, and bullying investigations are down as well. Um, in addition to that, we're seeing students who have an incident who are not repeating the incident over time, um, which is something that we were struggling with 
last year, um, which is why if you look at the data, um, I can report out unsubstantiated cases this year because they're representing um, more students, even though there are fewer amount of overall HHB investigations. Mm -hmm. So that's showing to me, right, the work that we're doing, the educational piece through the HHB process is supporting students um, and doing the learning that they need in order to not re-engage in those same behaviors. Um, Additionally, some of our behavior data for most of our schools looks better um, and we're seeing less rates of, you know, more extreme behaviors across the board. Um, one thing to note, right, is I think because we've improved in our sort of tier two, tier three um, supports for students and even anecdotally, right, like I am working with students with teams um, and seeing them be able to be stabilized and make progress forward, which is really, really exciting to see. Um, we're seeing our rates of belonging um, and our survey, given the fact that this is the first year of our survey, right, over the fall, winter, and spring, it's remained relatively stable. Um, and so I just sort of in reflecting on that and really thinking about how to really shift and push practice forward to be more inclusive and focus on belonging in tier one instructional practices too, so that we're not only supporting students with a higher level of SEL need, but we're also doing the work to push um, social emotional learning and belonging across the board universally. That's what I have for you. The work the students did around the belonging data? Yeah, so one of the things that we did at the high school and the middle school this year is after looking at the data, um, groups of students, uh, their sort of practice leadership group here and um, that same group at the middle school level, we looked at data um, and students created a universal circles that they led with every single student who was present that day to really look at um, and get feedback around. So what's going, what, what's going on in this data, right? We have this data that is um, showing that we want to improve our rates of belonging in our schools. So let's start to get at some of the qualitative data. What is the student experience, right? Because we know belonging, while we want a way to measure it quantitatively, makes it really helpful. It gives us a metric that we didn't have before. We also want to be able to focus really on student experience and get student voice in our next steps. Um, so students did go around, they had um, tier one circles getting feedback around like, how is your belonging? What are strategies that other students can do to have a better sense of belonging? What can faculty um, bring to the table too to support our belonging? Um, and then those students coded all of that data. So we had, thankfully, we had teachers who were willing to type up that data and sit in the corner and listen to what was going on. Um, and then we printed that data out, coded it, um, and then created major themes, which those student leaders brought to faculty meetings at the middle school and, and the high school, um, which was really wonderful to see. So continuing that work, certainly in the future and really thinking more about student voice and getting student perspective as we try and push belonging forward in our district. Thank you for the prompt, Libby. It's cool stuff. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, actually, my first question is about the belonging. I um, realize this is our first year doing it, and so it's great to have a benchmark. It does make me wonder what's the percentage we're aiming for. I mean, I'm sure, of course, it would be wonderful if it was 100%, but is that, I don't know if that feels realistic or if that's too much or... Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit later tonight, Mike and I, um, with a continuous improvement okay. plan. Um, so for the continuous improvement plan, which again, we'll talk to you later tonight, um, we decided to go with 10% because while we're, of course, um, trying to get to 100%, we want it to be something that we can really motivate folks to do. And it feels really um, meaningful and authentic. And like we have something that we can really aim for and 
authentically work towards. I think we've seen um, the sort of all or nothing approach when we sometimes aim for 100 that can feel like, oh, we can never get there. So, you know, what are the actual action steps? Whereas if we're talking 10% of students, right? That's about like 74% of the kids who were available to take, or sorry, 74 students who responded to the survey. And that feels really realistic across the district that we can move that amount of students forward. The 10% growth. 10% growth, growth, yeah. Okay. So I think it's at 62% and we'd yeah. like to see that to 72. Yeah. For in one year, that's the goal for, or oh, no, that's over the three years. It's two years, right? It's two years. Okay, I swear I did read it. Okay, thank you. No, um, when you don't have hair, you sweat a lot, so <laughs> there's not, you nothing from it back. Um, so I can talk about chronic absenteeism. Uh, we've this year we've seen a pretty dramatic decrease in chronic absenteeism. This year we've gone from 31 percent in the district last year to 19 percent this year. Um, and it's really exciting gains that we've seen. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons for those gains. Um, one of the things I think with chronic absenteeism, when you have a rate over 20% like we've had, you can't really case manage your way out of that. Like it really does require systemic change. It requires looking at things a little bit differently, focusing on mindsets more than it is just focusing on this student is now missing this much school and I have to do an intervention. Uh, so across our schools this year, we've seen a lot of effort put into some of the more systemic change, which is you all as parents maybe have seen more letters come home about raising awareness of what chronic absenteeism is, seeing it in the, the uh, parent newsletters that come home as well, really centering that being in school every day matters um, and putting energy behind our data, putting energy behind better understanding why students are not coming to school, what the barriers are, uh, and working toward that. We also... Um, you know, at the high school level, Jason and Emily have done a, a lot of work around um, paying close attention to early data. So with chronic absenteeism, which is missing 10% or more of the school year, you, you, you really need to do really quick work in September and October to respond to students that start. They really have only missed four days. Bless you. Sorry. Don't be. Great speech, by the way. So you really have to put a lot of energy early to respond to students, even if it's just that they've missed four days. To be chronically absent in a school year is to miss two days a month. Uh, and so you really need to act quickly. You really need to say, hey, we notice this, we see this, how can we support you? And sometimes like, oh, we just had, had the cold and the flu and it was bad timing. Um, and that's fine. But if we start to see it go two, two more days every month, and you're missing 18 days in a school year, has significant impact on academic growth, it has significant impact on SEL. Um, and, and so we really just need to respond early. And I think we've seen a lot of that this year in particular at UES, um, the specials team. So our, our music teacher and phys ed teachers, and art teacher and librarian, we would meet on Mondays and we would go through a list of chronically absent students in the district. And they were doing morning meetings at UES where a lot of the students would come to them first as a group. And they knew which students to kind of partner up with and to kind of buddy up to and be like, hey, I noticed you were out last week. And it's just like a really intentional but not um, overwhelming effort to make. It's kind of one of those low effort, high impact interventions that we have. Uh, and we saw a lot of gains there. And, and Julie's done a great job at Main Street Middle School as well. Every uh, Gator Bite, is that this, the parent letter? Gator Bite? Um, Gator News and, and stuff that goes out to staff quite a bit too, uh, will have the chronic absenteeism rate that week. And, and the full staff know what it is, they're looking at it. Um, so we've seen a lot of gains really across the district. The, the one area that I do highlight in the report too is like while we see gains, we also need to look at subpopulations, who, who's being, uh, who's overrepresented in our chronic absenteeism numbers. Uh, that includes students that qualify for free and reduced lunch, which is an economic indicator, right? So um, we look at those numbers. Those numbers are higher than what we see for our whole student population. We look at uh, the numbers for students that have an IEP. Those numbers are higher than we have for the whole student population. We look at young people experiencing homelessness. Those numbers are really high. Uh, and so there's a lot of work to do. So, so 
a, a lot of gains made and feeling really good about the work that all the schools have been doing around this. And we got to keep dialing in. We got to keep pushing. We got to keep um, better understanding our families, centering their voices and decision making uh, so that young people are able to access school in a way that feels good to them, feels good to their families um, and, and for our teachers. So those are those are big pieces for us. Stop there. Questions for that? I just want to say it's really great to see the you know, dramatic decrease of absentee put in. And is some of that also maybe we're getting a little back to normal after COVID as well? Or? No. Uh, <laughs> and the reason I can confidently say that is there's an analysis done state by state of attendance rates across the country. Um, there are three states that will release data throughout their year. Um, and what goes with those states tends to follow the national trend. So uh, it's Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, and Rhode Island are three states that will give data on chronic absenteeism for their whole state throughout the year. Um, and what we've seen from, uh, as numbers do start to come out later in the year, we're seeing 2%, 3% reductions kind of across the country. Um, and, and frankly, I think we expected that last year too. Yeah. Like we're back to normal. Um, but from three years ago, we were at 32% of the district last year, which was more normal than the year before we were at 31%. So there's more to it, I think, than just that. That's certainly a piece, but also families understanding how sick is too sick, right? Like that's changed a little bit. Like you've got the sniffles now and it doesn't mean you, you can't come to school for, you know, five days. Um, it, it's like, come to school and talk to nurse Megan and nurse Megan would be like, you're good. We got you. You can definitely stay and we want you to stay. Um, so I think a bit of that is also just like reprogramming and, and, um, just having a better understanding of what's happening as well. Excellent. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. I have a question. I think I've asked this before so many different things. But I think we use screen reduced lunch as one of the sort of subsets. And I know that that way of categorizing students and way of tracking that's changed. Is that, do you think that's impacting the figures at all? Or are we, did we, do we have a different way to get a pretty accurate? Treatment? Yeah. Um, I would say we have a more accurate snapshot today okay. than we've ever had with direct certification through uh, other programs yeah. in the state. So I think okay. our numbers are much higher than they've ever been as far as yep. young people that qualify, families that qualify. So I would say, yeah, they're probably more accurate today okay. than they're not dependent on when a... we were depending on a form. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I also wanted to say, I mean, great job in mm -hmm. reducing that percentage down to, to 20. And I'm curious to know what's the next goal. So that, cause we obviously don't want it to stay at 20. Yep. Yeah. So 19. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, there's a lot of what comes next and, and um, it's not maintenance at this point, right? It's, it's, there's an element to who has come off that list, right? So, so over a hundred young people uh, are not chronically absent this year where they were last year, right? Let's look at the 100 young people that are no longer on that list. It, the, the dominant group there is not the group that is historically marginalized. Um, we still have significant gaps in um, what's happening with students in our subpopulations, as I've mentioned. And so the work really is digging in, right? Like for young people who are experiencing homelessness, for 60% of those students to be chronically absent is not okay. Um, when we are dialing in on this, we need to continue to center their experience so that if we're in core meeting on a Monday morning and there's a decision being made, how is it that we're, you know, thinking about all of our families and the experience of, cool, we can deliver food all we want, but some families have a microwave. There's no stove, there's no hot plate. So any food we have to have has to be ready to go. Right, like just little things like that that I think can go a long way. That unless you're there, uh, and 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 their voices have been heard, we're missing the mark again and again, and in a way continuing to reinforce oppression. Right, and so the more we can center 
uh, all of our community. Um, the more we can welcome them to our schools, the more we can go to them uh, and be in their space uh, gives us a better understanding of what we have to do next. So in some ways for me to say, this is exactly what we have to do uh, wouldn't be fair. You know, it's, it's, I want to ask that question of our families and our students that aren't able to make it here as much and, and get a better understanding of why and what we can do. Part of it, Tim, to your point, is engaging academics. One of the, the positive conditions for learning, as we call them, is, is engaging academics. If you're a young person and you're missing, you know, 30 days in a school year and you've got all fours and, and I call you, I'm like, what's going on? They're like, I'm good. I'm like, what do you mean you're good? I got all fours. I'm like, fair enough? <laughs> like it's really hard for me and, and so in some ways I can go to Jason and have that conversation and he's a little bit like well shame on us for not introducing meaningful challenge that a student can miss 20% of the school year and not miss a beat like some young people absolutely are going to do that but how are we introducing challenge to them um, yeah. so so there's a ton of work you know I think um, but what I would center most is I think all of us talk about a lot is who are our families that are historically marginalized and how can we do better by them? Because they're overrepresented on all of our lists. Yeah. Yeah. So am I correct in hearing you say then that rather than really setting a goal for by the end of the 2024, 25 school year, we'll, at, we'll be at 15%. You're saying more, you're taking more of an individualized approach. Yeah. So again, I think when you have numbers over 20%, it's real systemic stuff that's happening yep. at that point in the chronic absenteeism front. And, and you do need to make bigger moves. Like I spent less time this year doing case management uh, than I did the previous two years. Mm. It, it, and, and part of that was just investing more time on what we could call tier one support yep. of um, what, what is the message that everyone's getting, you know, how in, like, and like, and what Jess is bringing to the table with, you know, how are our teachers delivering social emotional learning in their classes? How are we greeting young people when they come in our building? Those are big core steps. Um, and so I think moving forward, we do move it more into an individual uh, case management style, but there's still, we still need to systemically evaluate all of our data. We still need to make sure that whatever policies are in place are meeting the needs of the families. Uh, but I do expect it would be more case management because we're talking about not just students that were what we could call lower tier two. Uh, so just at 10, 11, 12% that they got to nine, and it's now those students that are at missing 20, 21, and beyond mm -hmm. uh, that we need to move the needle on. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Just one last question um, came from a community member today. Uh, is there anything that our community can do to help you? Um, send your kids to school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really, yeah. I mean, honestly, there's little things and, and I have these conversations all day. Um, the perception of what it means to be in school every day has faded for all of us. Um, and when I say missing two days a month is to be chronically absent, most people will be like, it's not that big of a deal, dude. It's two days a month. I extended my vacation because flights are cheaper. All the things. Um, it is a really big deal. And there's a ton of research to back up the fact that young people that are chronically absent perform worse on, on their academic performance they are less social emotionally connected. They are not on Jess's belonging list of these are the students saying I completely belong or belong quite a bit. Um, and so two days a month matters a great deal. And the research backs it up. We can look at our own data and evaluate, you know, who are students that are chronically absent? Where's their academics? How does that compare to students that aren't? It's dramatic. So, I mean, I think just keep communicating that like every day matters a great deal. I was just thinking about one of the things that the administrative team is doing this summer to try to make more of those personal connections is supporting the Essex West where the school district is bringing um, food on a weekly basis to the Montpelier Family Center. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. You know, for any kids under 18 to get food. And so the admin team are going to be helping deliver food to families and that kind of stuff so that we are going to where they live and being able to connect them on there. That's great. That's great. Well, 
that yeah. Is Great question. Um, it it does. So in the state of Vermont, the, the the it's hard to find, but the law says a student has to be in school to get sixty six percent of their instructional day to be counted for the full day of attendance. So at the high school, we saw the most dramatic reduction in chronic absences. Part of that is that we aligned uh, our formula to meet the state standard of what it means to be counted as a full day. Um, and so when students don't attend, at least like let's say at the high school, I think it's three of their main blocks, uh, they're marked absent. If they make three, they're marked present. Um, we used to count every period at the high school, which um, you know uh, didn't do any favors to Jason uh, and, and the numbers of chronically absent students here. Uh, so we did change that, but yeah, I mean, when I say missing school, I'm also, the reason I say that is lost instructional time. And that's my big thing is like, you know, we talk about excused absences, unexcused absences. It's not very popular, but I don't, I'm not too wrapped up on if it was excused or not. I'm wrapped up on lost instructional time. So the young person's cutting class. Um, we actually, uh, Leslie, they both is amazing. And uh, Catherine, Nunnally, they do great work. They will mark that in uh, the attendance in power school and that gets translated to the product. But yeah, it's an issue for sure. Uh, <laughs> all good. We're out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't, yeah. We're, just, yeah. we're thrilled you're here tonight. Mary will watch you. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Having those conversations because I think it's an important part of this whole discussion that doesn't get talked about a lot. Yeah, thanks. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, thanks for coming on this hot night. And this, I mean, it's great to get this data. It really helps the board understand how we're doing. Uh, really appreciate the hard work. We appreciate the progress uh, on all fronts. Um, which I know is a product of your great work and, and the teachers' great work and all our educators and everyone in the system. So so thank you, this is really important. And yeah, um, you know, just I think we've said this before, but the quality of the data over the years has really improved dramatically. And it's, it's, uh, it really helps us understand, you know, what you're doing and how it's working. Thanks. Uh, so next item, uh, potential merger updates. We've got the talk about the CIP. Oh, yeah. Thank you for noticing. Which Go for it, sorry. approved by the board tonight. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've got questions. Go ahead. <laughs> Great. Um, well, first of all, my comment is that it's, look, it, it's very exciting to see it pretty well aligned with the priorities that the board set last year. Um, so that was... Very cool. Um, one, my first note, my second note, I guess, is actually this continuous improvement plan includes science under the academic academical, and we don't have one. So that might just be a note for the board that maybe we want to look at science, or maybe we leave that to our educational experts and we stick with math and literacy. Um, that can just be a conversation we have at another time. I just noted that. Um, my one question I have around equity and inclusion, I see those equity supports on page three, and I appreciate the note that the equity groups that have been identified are included in both goals, of mm -hmm. course. Um, can you say a little bit more under the, um, the prioritized, prioritized strategies, it looks like that's a little bit of like how the implementation of these goals will, will include the folks that are in those equity groups. Sure. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so our big overall premise is Nick said, if you are engaged in your academics, your belonging goes up. Yep. If your belonging goes up, you're engaging in your academics. So to us, the work is inclusive of everybody. We were required to identify these particular groups in our CIP plan. And so there's, there's little things like you'll see in um, the free and reduced lunch, we mentioned the chronic absenteeism focus for those students and things like that. But in general, our strategy and our working theory is that if we do better at these four things, 
students in all of these groups are going to show improvement across academic achievement and a sense of belonging. I think I understand that. And I think we, one of the things we've talked about is that we have to know where those kids are at as well. So, but I didn't see that necessarily reflected in the plan, but maybe that's because that's not well, we do I'm discuss our, it our disproportionality data is a big part of the, this and our opportunity gap data, which we haven't unpacked with the school board yet right. in the community, but that is a key driver in this. As Nick was also talking about that, it's like looking at that data and figuring out how are these students over or underrepresented in these key areas of our systems and how do we uh, tackle that? Great. And so we've got that data now, which is really great and starting to, but it's really it's really dense. Yeah. Um, so unpacking that, figuring out where does that tweak in SEL land, or does it SEL and academic achievement that we do these things and try and target these things. Got it. So we did mention that in here. Okay, good. That was what I was yeah. not fully gleaning from the plan. And did you say so? Those equity one groups were those chosen by the AOE, or did yes. we select those? Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, and then the the last one I have is just as an offering, um, which is that you have the column that is human resources. Um, I think another item on that list could be board oversight, because I think this is another use of the human resources of our district. Um, so I just wanted to offer that as an additional. Thank you. Questions? I think, um, I think the one thing I noticed too, I think kind of piggybacks on the same idea I was saying before with academic achievement, it seems a very proficiency-based um, the, the, where I'm seeing the sort of strategies and change ideas. And, you know, I thought that dot chart was really amazing and, and, and thoughtful. And I just wonder if um, incorporating that into the, into the prioritized strategies and change ideas to really sort of hit that growth um, rather than, and, and maybe it's in there and I just, I'm not as familiar with the- So, so that's um, gonna happen. Uh, a couple of things about the CIP that's a little bit elusive. We're, we're required to have an academic achievement goal and we're required to have the, the belonging goal. And the basis the AOE made for the equity groups that we had is based on BT cap. So it made sense to us that our CIP also be measured on BT cap. And that's a proficiency base. Yes. But our theory is that we're going to spend time talking about that growth. We're not talking about teaching to the test. We're talking about good, high quality instruction. So we will be talking about those that growth data and we'll see the results in the BT cap. Um, so it is a part of this, but it doesn't have to be named. This is the formal document that goes to the state and says this is what our continuous improvement plan is. I see. But everything we talked about in that data report is a part of this work. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good question. Do I have a motion to approve the continuous improvement plan? No. So second. Second. Any further discussion? Is, is this a requirement of every LEA? Yeah. And it's is it how often does it need to be updated? Every two years. But what so I would add is this is a living document. So if we learn something new from our disproportionality data in the fall, we can revisit it, rewrite it, update it, do those things. All in favor? Aye. Uh, can you opposed? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's do a couple of merger updates, then we can do the real quick. Um, Uh, so merger updates, and I just, these two items are really kind of to inform the board about further 
further actions and just kind of where things are because these are both deep, deep, deep conversations that we're not gonna have tonight. Um, so uh, Libby and I met with uh, Megan Roy and Ordia Smith and Stephen Delager Payne. Payne. Yes, Tate. Okay, yeah. I was close. Um, and just for context, uh, Floor is the chair of the Washington Central Board, um, and uh, is Megan outgoing. is the outgoing superintendent. Stephen is the incoming superintendent from. Uh, Wash Central and Stephen is an internal hire. So he has been this, the principal of U32 for a while. So he's, he's familiar with the district. Um, and Mia was gonna join us, but Mia had higher priorities, which was having her kiddo, uh, accompany her kiddo to step up day at MSMS. Um, the long and the short of it is that, um, you know, they are going through a uh, a consolidation or reconfiguration conversation, um, which obviously is a big topic. They are also experiencing um, a drop in student enrollment, actually a dramatic one. We're, we're seeing a slight dip. They're experiencing, they're gonna be something like 100 fewer kids in I think U32 in what, two or three years? In yeah. two years. Um, so they are getting some of the questions that we have been getting during both the budget process and quite honestly for the majority of probably everyone's lifetime here, uh, which is questions about merger. Um, what they, where, where they are, and I think, um, where at least Libby and I are and, and we are is would like to start steps towards a, a study of what that merger would look like. Um, and so as a next step, we are uh, proposing that we uh, either come to both boards individually or perhaps have a joint board session and just go through what that study would look like. It's, there's a process that I believe is, is required by statute um, where a committee would be formed, represented from both boards, community members. Um, uh, the result would be a kind of detailed study of various scenarios, you know, looking at, you know, what the, what the cost savings would be, you know, how building configurations could be put together, uh, et cetera. Um, I'll share my thinking on why it makes sense. Um, one, it's, it's a question that's been in the community for a long, long time. Uh, two, we obviously have some, some challenges that both are ongoing and some new challenges. You know, the flood, I think, illustrated some of our um, challenges around this building. Uh, we also do have uh, slightly declining enrollment, and this area has declining enrollment. So we're, um, you know, we have fewer students, which impacts both our tax base, but also, uh, you know, what our, our educational needs are, classes getting smaller, et cetera. Um, yeah, and uh, we've got education funding on a state level that's becoming more and more challenging. So, uh, and then we have a community that that um, I think is very curious about what this might look like uh, with a lot of different opinions. So uh, I think, uh, you know, this would be a, a first step in, in seeing uh, what the answer to some of the questions are, what the advantages might be, what the disadvantages might be, because right now there's a lot of of speculation and guesswork um, and not really a lot that, that we can point to even on some of the basic questions like could everyone fit into U32 and if so how, um, you know, if we were to do that, um, you know, where, what would the middle school situation look like? A lot of basic questions um, that need to be answered. So, so that's where we're at. Um, I guess, uh, you know, just and I'll turn it over to Scott to talk about the, the email from uh, CVCC. Again, not a deep discussion here, but I just a gut check. Does that kind of sound right? That and also, um, you know, Wash Central is planning to have a vote on the reconfiguration in the fall. We thought they might want to wait for that vote to to happen. Um, they're actually willing to move prior to that vote, uh, at least to take the steps to you know to start you know gauging interest of both boards in forming a committee. Um, we just 
talked about the reality of the summer and thought probably the earliest we could actually get this moving would be in September. Um, but I just wanted to just do a quick gut gut check if that conversation makes sense, if those next steps make sense, if there's any you know major concerns or objections, um, I can get them out there. But uh, does that just seem like a good general direction to go through? And again, it would it would just be the first step of explaining what the process would look like to both boards. Both boards would then have to approve entering the process. Um, so there's plenty of time to discuss details down the road. But uh, you know, if anyone feels that this is a non-starter, it would be good to express that now. Just a really quick question. Is there anything in statute that describes what the process has to look like, like how long it has to take, or what, the, like how much flexibility do we in Wash Central have in determining what that process looks like? I have not looked at the statute in detail, so I'm. This is an answer that's that's a semi-educated guess. I think there are some things that need to be prescribed. I I don't think it's overly prescriptive. But I, I could be I could be wrong on that. One thing I do understand is that there is not a magic wand that is going to wave and and make this merger happen quickly. Yeah, that's kind of what I was going to say. Yeah. Wondering about like what say say what, what does such a process generally speaking what kind of time frame does that take? It, are are we looking at like a year to year process if we do that and because i part of what i'm wondering is if, if it seems all very intimidating and um and and big to me it would be helpful to just kind of have a i'm sure there's like a state report out there somewhere if we get forwarded like what what is you know what is merging with another district look like so we can I, i'd rather read that before giving a sort of initial cut check on on that I don't know if there is a report. And I think all mergers are slightly different. Sure. My kind of general sense from you know looking into this a bit, it, it would probably, you know, and and the complexity of a merger depends on you know, what the situations are. My guess is that the the study would probably take, I, I would say probably a year, at least a school year, to really kind of get together to you know to work with experts. Again, we're talking about looking at you know crunching crunching numbers, looking at at how how tax rates might might change, um, really doing a detailed dive into the buildings, into how they operate, what the classes are, um, you know, what sort of like economy of scale would you be able to get? Say if you had one AP English class instead of two, and you know, how many how many students might might go into there, and um, you know what the what you could save in terms of administrative overhead, um, you know, what the existing facilities are. Uh, you know, challenges about would 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 we be able to use our existing buildings? Um, how could we use our existing buildings? Um, I just I just said building for the statute. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and and then there would probably be my guess is another year or two of bringing those out to the community because um, there's a lot of big opinions out there. Yeah. You know? Um, uh, and then there would probably be some sort of vote, uh, assuming we got there. Um, and then my guess is there probably would be another year or so before it actually happened just to, you know, just to, to do the, the implementation details of, you know, moving people around and, and getting the buildings ready, et cetera. So, I'd say I'd say a three to four year process. If and it's, it's one of those things where you could do the study in both communities, go get study and be like, there's not a path forward. And is there like a price tag on this thing? It sounds like there's a there's probably some yeah. consultants involved in this analysis. Do, do we have any history of other schools or when we went through it before of sort of what price tag? I mean, we when we merged with Roxbury, uh, it was I don't think we. And the, for one, we had consultants. The, the state, I believe, provided funding for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure the state funding. I, I don't believe it was it was super expensive. Um, you know, my guess is there probably would be some consulting fees that we'd probably share 
with both districts because we probably want someone like a Turex Collins or yeah. some of the expertise to look, particularly at the building and, you know, and obviously there needs some expertise in running some of the tax numbers. So, um, you know, there would be, there would be expense. Sure. I'll go with any assumptions. Yeah. There is a, it's a couple years old now, but there is an Act 46 summary report of all the mergers up to that point. Like okay. I said, I think it's a couple years old, but I was looking at that when we were having our conversation about Roxbury and the school. Um, so it does have sort of a summary of what happened as a result of Act, Act 46 that's helpful okay. um, in the different configurations. Um, yeah, I'm very supportive of you guys having that conversation. I think there's a big difference between conversation and but also I think it would be really, um, I think it's really important. And I think it's, it, it's, a, it's the reality. I think we yeah. would be, um, we would be um, being pretty stubborn to not have that conversation. Um, there's so many reasons why we need to have that conversation, but the one that sort of is the like flashing light to me right now was the report that we got recently from the consultant about the future of this particular building in the floodplain. I just feel like that's, that, that just feels like if nothing else, that was really pushing the conversation. You add on the enrollment projections, the budget struggles. Um, there's so many things that our kids already do together. So I actually am not as concerned about that particular piece. So I think having the conversation is definitely yeah. worthwhile. So thank you for doing that. Oh, thanks, Jill. And also, I mean, you know, Tim, as we, as you just kind of moved to have a joint conversation about whether we want the stu study committee, a great thing to do would just be, I mean, we've got a few months, so like, you know, send those questions and we can try to come into that conversation prepared to you know, talk about what you know, you know what consultancies would look like and you know again you know right now we're proposing that we bring the idea kind of formally to both boards both boards ask what they need to make a decision and if both boards feel it makes sense to move forward then we move forward again that would be a an early fall conversation jake sorry to keep you on on hold yeah, no problem. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so I, I think this is great, and uh, I definitely support um, getting the ball rolling. Uh, my question is, um, for the meeting that you had recently, was that like a, a conversation about like a, a full merger of the two districts? So there would just be a single district? Um, and and I guess a sort of follow up that I'll just ask right now is like, are there intermediate options available to us, such as like um, keeping a elementary and middle school, but sending to a different district for high school or tuitioning uh, for high school? There may be. I mean, the conversation we had was the, the possibility of a full merger, and I think a commission like this could look at some some ways for the districts to maybe cooperate on a way that that's scaled up. And and we do some of that already, you know, particularly in 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 places like um, you know athletics where uh, and, and clubs where we have some things that they don't, and they have some things that we don't, and and we let students move back and forth. We also have, you know, an exchange program um, that allows some kids to uh, attend, you know, the other district's high school actually without tuition. We just we just do an exchange. Um, so those are definitely things that that we can look at as part of it. But the the you know what we were talking about was was a commission that would would also look at a a full. Uh, a full merger. Which doesn't necessarily mean that an elementary school or middle school closes at all. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Yeah, no, I mean, in, in some ways it, it could happen with, with many of the schools operating, mm -hmm. you know, close to or the same way that you can. Yeah, just to Jake's point about the uh, other options that are out there, I would love that if and when we get to that point for those to be also part of the conversation. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, we will, um, 
we will learn some more about what the process looks like. And I mean, I would I would prefer to get both our boards together and just give one joint presentation, both for economy and also uh, we have had a couple of joint board meetings, but not in a while. It's just good to know who our, our neighbors are. Um, it's been a long time that I don't think I've ever participated in a yeah. board meeting. It's been, it's, it was pre-COVID, I think. It was pre-Libby. <laughs> it might have been pre-Libby. We've had like... Been four was not the chair then. Yeah, it, was, it might have been... like four mem board members come together, but not full boards. Yeah, I think it was like 2018, maybe. Um, so then the letter? Yeah, so the letter. I think maybe Jill... Um, has a little bit more context. I don't know how much. Um, I can take a stab at the, at uh, least the, the up until March of this year, because yeah. <laughs> I was just joined in March. And so I and yeah, so it's taking me a little while to sort of get up to speed. Um, and so, yeah, if you want to just give your understanding of the context, because that I think will be a lot more helpful than mine. Sure. Um, so Center Vermont Career Center School District is one of the independent technical center districts in Vermont. Um, that is very recent. Um, they are still located in the same building as Spalding High School. Um, and that career center serves uh, like six districts, I believe us, Harwood, Twinfield, Cabot, um, uh, very unified. I'm sorry if I'm, oh, did I say Harwood, U32? Um, so a lot of, you know, they serve a, a wide swath of kids and um, the work that they do there obviously is really important to our economy and providing all those opportunities for students. And those are careers that are very much in demand. And so they actually turn away a lot of kids um, that might be very good candidates to participate. Um, that combined with just, I think they're outgrowing their space and what might have been um, career and technical education 30, 40 years ago is not necessarily what it is now. So um, during my time on the board, we, um, we set a goal of getting the Career Center a new state-of-the-art facility. Um, this is just, like I said, there's lots of reasons why that would make a lot of sense. And there's a lot of um, maybe not tension, but it's been really challenging for them to expand their programs in any way with a very limited space they have in that existing building. Um, and it sort of every year continues to kind of their footprint and what they're allowed to use is shrinking. Meanwhile, the demand for what they're providing is growing. Um, and there's a lot of support from the industries around Central Vermont for welding, electrical, construction, all the things that we all know that we need. Um, so there's a lot of momentum behind that. So the board set a goal of hoping by 2029 that the Career Center would have a new facility. Um, and so I think as part of that conversation, right, it would be um, pretty myopic to not reach out to the boards of the various sending schools. And especially knowing like we're all sort of talking about buildings and facilities and the future and enrollment projections um, that I think the board, the Career Center board wanted to just put that out there to see if anyone wanted to have a conversation, see what the possibilities are. I mean, I definitely like, if, if you could wave a magic wand and we needed to find somewhere, it'd be great to have sort of a central Vermont high school that had career center and a high school all in the same place. And it was this magical beacon on the hill, but um, those things cost money. Um, but my understanding from reading the note is sort of a combination of putting the feelers out to the different boards um, and just letting the boards know that the career center is actively looking for space. Um, it does seem like it is pretty a pretty good model for co-location or at least being really close to the high school for kids to have access. Um, that's sort of the model at some of the other technical center districts around Vermont. So I know that the superintendent, and I think I was just off the board when they took these really yeah. fun tours around, yeah, <laughs> around some really beautiful um, facilities that Trucks Collins has done in Maine to just sort of get the juices flowing about what the possibilities are. Um, so that's that's my context. Yeah, and, and then that's when I joined the board. I did not go <laughs> on the junket to me. I mean, the, the trip out to me. It would have been the junket for me because I knew nothing uh, at that point. Um, and so um, everything that you said about the, the ideas um, from the board to, to reach out are, were exactly correct. So we had a meeting um, 
two Mondays ago when and Trex Collins actually presented to the CBCC board the results of their visioning process. Um, and so that they had gone through a whole um, site selection process where they looked at you know, like 200 sites in the central Vermont area, they sort of mapped out those districts that, that Jill mentioned and said, all right, well, it's got to be within this area that's close enough to all of these sending schools. It's got to meet all the criteria of sewage and water and, you know, all of the things that architects think about before finding a place to build a building. Um, and then uh, when they went through that sorting process, it came up with seven sites that meet the, the like all of the criteria. Um, and, and in fact, one of the top sites is land directly next to U32. Um, and so, of course, there, there, there are some others up near the airport, um, out in, in Barrytown. And so the CVCC board voted to give Jody, the, the superintendent, the authority to, to reach out to those landowners just to say, hey, would you be interested in, in discussing, you know, selling the land for the purchase of the high school? And so at that point, yeah, the, the CDCC board understanding that U32 is going through this facilities uh, visioning. We have just gone through our facilities visioning. It made sense to, to pause and say, hey, like, we're, we're going through the we The CDCC board is going through this process, and we know that other um, towns are dealing with it. They're, they're um, the proposed facility would when, when it's built it would be it would serve a full day um, of programming for I think something like 500 high school students which would make it one of if not the largest high school in Vermont uh, in central Vermont and so again knowing the um, like enrollment um, trends that we're looking at um, th th that would severely impact all of the sending schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that that was the motivation to say we need to have a conversation and see see where the other boards are um, with this idea, and yeah, and so that that led to the letter. And I think in the letter, basically, it was like, you know, do you? I can't remember. There were a couple of asks right at the end. It was like, I'm not looking at it right now. I should be. But it's like, you know, do you want to talk or what do you think or something like that? And so I do think we should respond to. Um, to the CBCC board with, with something. I don't know when that needs to happen, um, but. So if I could summarize what I think the letter said is basically, we're getting started on this process. Do you want to join us? Is that, was, is that essentially? I, I, yes, and acknowledging that there are the, the whatever process CBCC goes through is going to impact everybody yeah, else and that a lot of other um, communities are having similar conversations right and so it just right. made sense we're all neighbors we're having similar conversations our decisions are going to impact each other um, let's let's you know have a mm -hmm. conversation together Thoughts? Did you say Jake? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, so uh, I guess my question is, um, and I, I apologize for not knowing the basics or not remembering them. Um, when a school district uh, when a student from a school district goes to the career technical center, um, do they uh, do they not are they are they not part of the you know original district's enrollment anymore? Uh, do you lose that student from the original district and they become you know a, a pupil count from at the career technical? district because um, I think that's why Scott was bringing up the population growth in the in the, the career technical center yes and no financially the money goes to the student however we're still the LEA of the student so, so the, we, career, the career center can expel the student and they come back to us and we're responsible for their education and we pay some set amount to the career center, 
for that student? Yeah, it's a six semester average. Okay. Um, and then I had some other question, but I think I'm forgetting it. Um, yeah, it might come back to me, but thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. I think that's part of the challenge too, right? Is that there's a very limited amount of money in the education fund. <laughs> and so, um, and the way that Vermont funds career and technical education sort of creates a disincentive for participation because it's like taking money from one place and putting it in the other rather than having it be a collaborative, like shared. Um, so I yeah. think that's problematic. And I, I, I know there were some bills introduced about career and technical education changing the funding. I, I have no idea if that went anywhere. I don't think they went anywhere this legislative session, but I don't think they're going away either. Okay. Are we in a pre-existing district that weds us to this particular career and technical education, or are there other ones within proximity that are reasonable alternatives? Yeah, the vast majority of our kids go to CVCC who go to the Tech Center. We do have some kids who attend Randolph, the Randolph Tech Center, and we do have some kids who attend Essex um, Technical Center, and we pay tuition to that. Um, it's you know, we don't provide transportation to those buildings, whereas we're required to provide transportation to CBCC. We are attached to CBCC. Yeah. That is our, our technical center, but certainly other kids, kids who have moved here and were going to Essex previously and want to continue, you know, like that happens um, infrequently, but there's a few, few kids or, you know, Randolph offers something that CBC doesn't offer, for instance, and a kiddo wants to go there. <laughs> Yeah, Tim, the construct is that each of the six districts that are part of the Center Vermont Career Centers like serving districts, we each have a voting board member. So each of the, that's why I was our voting board member. So this board has a vote on it and Twinfield and Harwood and Cabot. And, and then there's a, a proxy like community member who's elected. So it's a combination of representation from each of the boards and a community member from each of the districts. Yeah. Jake. Thanks. Um, Jill, I think it was a few years ago that you worked on like a governance change um, mm -hmm. to, to maybe make the Career Center its own district. Is that what happened? Yes, that is correct. And that's what happened. Yep. Um, is it possible to make the Career Center uh, like reabsorbed into some a school district um, or is that like not advisable? I have, I, I'm sure it's possible. I have no idea. And that would be a big bummer because I just did it a couple of years ago. Um, I, I'm sure it is possible. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. The reason I ask is because like, um, it's like a, you know, sort of complicated wrinkle with the, with the conversation with, with um, Washington Central like you know if if there was to be a career center built ne right next to it like um you know how does that impact the financials um and so you know not that i understand any of it at this point um but it would be something for somebody to consider uh yeah. down the line i mean it would that wouldn't be any different than it is right now like right now the career center is literally in the building that spalding high school is in and yet it's all of our shared Career center, so they, it could rem, the governance structure could remain the same, um, regardless of where it's located. Mm -hmm. So is it a tenant in the Spalding High School? Yeah, it's a, it's it's a tenant, like we think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's now. now, right? So. Um, it's not necessarily the case that you would need to quote unquote merge with the CBCC right. district right. in order to partner with them on say building a new building. Mm -hmm. um, that's not that we don't have to have that conversation, but we might say, oh yeah, we're, we're interested in a new building. You're interested in a new building. Maybe we should talk about sharing resources. Mm -hmm. We might say that. I'm not saying we should say that but it's yeah we don't have to think about it as at the level of 
a merger of districts. Right. Right. That's very clarifying. Thanks, Jay. Do our sense of how we should respond? I mean, my sense is we should be non committal and say, yes, we're exploring things too, and let's keep channels of communication open. Yeah, because we're we have sort of more questions than answers. Yeah, exactly. For us too, yeah. but we should definitely keep our ear. Yeah. We should all keep talking, and because whatever we all do will influence each other for the next yeah. thirty yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the thing that that struck me the most is is that so if CVCC builds a brand new facility that's co-located with U thirty two. Um, and their plan would be to, to build a, a like it's it's a, its own high school, and it would be a full day program. So they would have to have certain facilities, and so those facilities could actually be shared with U thirty two, and we're going to be at least having conversations with whether or not we want to be merging with U thirty two. So it might actually be us as a part of U thirty two who's get so it's it's all sort of, mm -hmm. and so yeah. yeah. It gets messy and yeah, so here we are. So they issue their debt, like their municipality issue debt to contract that to, to construct. I don't know about debt, but we all vote separately on their budget. And then their their budget has to get passed by all the voters in the districts and then we pay a tuition. We being the various sending districts pay a tuition. So it's kind of a it was kind of a strange construct as these school budgets were getting voted down, the district would still be liable to pay the the career center budget passed. Yeah. So if our budget continued to not pass, we would still be responsible for paying our tuition to the career center. But I don't know about I assume they have their own bond, but the high school will be paying our share of that bond. So the, the idea is the tuition goes up to Make the bond payment. I'm not sure how uh, it will work out, like structured but, financially, but but that bond would be on us. Like our yeah. town would vote. Each town would vote yeah. for each a town passage of would the have bond. to vote for the bond. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah. would it would each town have to pass it, or would it be a? I don't know. I would assume so. It's six well, districts or district like or like the the sum total of just the districts is just. I don't know about for bonding, but for yeah. passing the budget, that's true. They're commingled. Yeah. Um, from the 18 towns. I don't know how. But I don't know if it's different for a bond. I mean, I'm much like the 32, I'm thinking about the beginning of my journey of understanding. And so I'm very sure. interested in learning more and talking to people who share our interests. The good thing is, we all are. Yeah. <laughs> You're not alone. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. true. Yeah, no, I, that's why I kind of think we should yeah, have a, an answer of like, yeah, there's a lot out there and, you know, let's keep channels of communication open, but um, a, a lot of a lot of dust needs to settle. Yeah, we're talking like very big, like theoretical, but really important, like big decisions that we all are going to make and the Career Center and D30, you know, we're all kind of like, so it's a question mark, but we definitely can't just all continue to not, not talk. you know, hope it all goes away. Yeah, <laughs> right. No, it's not, it's not going to all go away. No. And, and if we ignore it, I think some things are going to be mm -hmm. visited upon us in unpleasant ways. <laughs> yeah, and and the conversations that were happening with the CBCC board about buying property, those, that was a public meeting. And yeah. so as of last Monday, the, the, the news, and in fact, I think the following Tuesday, Twin Fields was having their meeting. And so the letter was sent Tuesday, whatever, during the day, so that the Twin Fields board had it and time to meet and talk. And so... The thinking was that the information is out there. Let's get everyone like on the same page as soon as possible, so that yeah, the conversation can move forward. Um, who wants to take a stab at drafting such a response? I can take a stab at it. If that's helpful, but so, yeah, I promise I won't be biased in my draft. Yeah. No, and then we and um, yeah, we, and I'll, I'd be happy to just give a review. Okay. 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 Perfect. Thank you. And it sounds like it doesn't have to happen like tonight. Right. Um, anything further on that? And then we can give Libby a, a quick moment and then uh, got the uh, false monitor report. So I'm just going to.
So the question is, how was this decision made? Is that the question? Yeah. And, I, and again, this is, I just want to, just from a board perspective, this is very much an operational decision, which is not the purview of the board, but I think it's definitely helpful for the board to understand how operational decisions like yeah. this are made, especially uh, when you have questions about it. Uh, and then also just kind of from a, at least one board member expressed that there were any questions about it, kind of, you know, how to field the questions. Um, if you know how to field the questions, always feel free to suggest that the person reach out to uh, either Libby or if it's a building question to the principal. Um, and of course, you yourself can also reach out and ask you know, the question as well. But um, you know, it's you know, we're we're not necessarily you know, we don't have a role in operational decisions. And just given that a lot are made and, and made oftentimes, you know, kind of, kind of quickly and, and in response to circumstances, um, you know, it, it's it's not, I think, incumbent upon us to know uh, the details of the operational decisions. I would just add to that, too, is that when questions are being posed to board members that I don't hear, I don't know they're being asked. Um, and then, um, and so I like to know where people are standing and I can't if, if I don't get them myself. So please encourage people. Can we assume you get the school board ones? I get okay. the school board ones. Yeah. yeah, anything that goes to a school board one, I, I do see. But um, I, what you hear at the co-op, she doesn't hear it. <laughs> but sometimes people assume I'm in that conversation. Yeah. So um, so I just, just send them my way or you ask on their behalf. Um, so this particular decision on Friday afternoon, about two hours before graduation, the union leadership um, came to be pretty strongly about the, the forecast coming up. Um, we went back and forth a little bit around, are there statutes and you know that kind of thing um, with just union leadership quickly. I reached out to my principals and central office team prior to right before graduation, just to get their thoughts and feelings, looked at a whole lot of weather forecasts um, our, it is not a secret that our Montpelier buildings are incredibly warm when it reaches 80 degrees um, outside and when it continually reaches 96 degrees for multiple days, it's, it's rather torturous. Um, so we convened a meeting at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning um, with myself, Jason, Julie, Linda Beaupre, um, Joe Carroll, who is the union president, and um, Jeff O'Hara, who runs part two, um, to just talk it out, talk out what the positives were, what the negatives were. Um, there was no secret the buildings, buildings were going to be hot, and we would not be able to cool them down. Um, and so my line in the sand was, if we can figure out childcare, then we can make arrangements. Um, and so Jeff was able to work very quickly with his staff to get staff here. Oh, wait, we have one question for you. <laughs> He's like, can I go home now? <laughs> Andrew just broke down his third promotion ceremony. So thank oh you, gosh. Andrew, with Tom, I'm sorry, with Tom Allen. Um, did we have to get public bids on the switches? Um, no, because those were based on emergency. The, the AOE lifted their bid requirement. Their bidding process there was like because we're the emergency. And Benoit does all our work here, so they know exactly what we're going to that answer your question? Well, they, we had the raising them up out of the yep. space. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Understood. Thank you. I knew the answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Long Dick Shower. Thank you for your hard work. Um so we were meeting at eight o'clock. My line in the sand was that I, we need, oh, and Shannon was there too for Roxbury, sorry. Um, we needed to ensure that childcare was, was able to be had. Jeff also pointed out that the buildings weren't any cooler just because it was part two staff there. <laughs> um, and so, which we all understood. Um, and the team ultimately with union representation as well voted to, for the change of schedule. Um, I will, I will be the first one to readily say that this decision came slightly, e it was not an easy decision. I did not sleep Friday night, but it did. It was an easier decision because of where we are in the school year. I will also say that I worry about precedent setting big time, particularly with our union. Um, 
And I will also say that it came true. We took temperatures all day today. We were running around with little with guns and our principal, you know, the temperature guns. And uh, you know, MSMS high temp was 95 degrees without kids in the building. So upstairs, like no kids. There hadn't been a kid in the room. Um, Montpelier High School, the high temp here, we moved everybody down to the first floor here at Montpelier High School because we could, because there were so few kids here taking doing retakes. A high temperature was 89 degrees in a classroom. At UES, they had the ultimate high. It was 93 degrees um, in uh, a fourth grade classroom. It was in Morgan's. Um, so, you know, the other things to think about it was Julie took the temperatures at 7 a.m. at the upstairs of MSMS before anybody was in the building except for her and Mickey. And it was already 83 at Main Street Middle School on the second floor. So um, that's just untenable to, to be in a room with 20 kids. It's just untenable. There, there is no learning. Right. There's not a whole lot of learning going on the last few days of school anyway, if we're honest. Um, taking kids outside in this heat was not an option. That would probably have been worse, quite honestly, for health. Um, so I feel pretty good about this decision. I understand being a working parent, I understand that this could, can be challenging for parents. Um, and every time I have to cancel school, it's challenging for parents. There's not a doubt in my mind about, there's no question about that. And it's also a very challenging decision to make every single time, unless it's a blizzard, when it's just obviously cut and dry. I appreciate blizzards. I don't appreciate ice. So it's, it's, uh, it was not an easy call. It was a collaborative call between the leadership team. Um, and I, and it was pushed by our teachers union, which they are right to push. Any other questions about? No, I thought your explanation when you announced it was made total sense. I can sympathize, but I've been feeling very protective and defensive of this decision today because I feel like other than maybe like the president or like Taylor Swift, I feel like the superintendent is the front lines of everything that's happening in our world. And somehow you're also also supposed to solve it. So thank you for continuing to manage climate change yes. and pandemics and everything. With, and with if I had a direct line at Taylor Swift, that would totally increase I mean, my cool it, I'm factor. I'm sure it's her fault. Right? <laughs> yeah, I know her first cousin. Case. Oh boy, Jim's got it in for me. <laughs> but I do. I, I think this year has been really unusual, and I, 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 you know, I have a kid who now doesn't need childcare, but it was the single most stressful, and um, you know, so I, I respect that, and I also feel like every decision that's been made this year for closures, and of course, this was the right decision, and was made with thoughtfulness and care, and in collaboration, and so I, I, I don't think you had any choice. Um, and I think if you, regardless of what decision you make in any of these situations, there will also be people who say, how dare you require my kid yeah. to come in when it's 90 degrees. So um, I, I completely sympathize. It's not easy for anyone, but I also don't think you had any choice. And I appreciate that you always explain your decision. Although getting a call from MRPS message on like a sunny Saturday mm -hmm. afternoon, we we're all like, we we're with a bunch of other families and kids, and we're all going. Like, what is happening? Yeah. <laughs> Why? I tried but to that also first. meant that you and your leadership team were working on Saturday morning at eight a.m. after graduation to figure this oh, out. Oh yeah, we were working pretty much. I was working all day trying to get the bus, making sure the busing could happen, and all that kind of jazz. So, yeah. I bothered Stacy Emerson, our bus coordinator, at her daughter's graduation, with, and I kept bothering her until she answered me, and I felt really bad about that, <laughs> but. I needed to know that before I could inform families and I wanted to give families as much time as possible. Um, and I do also want to say this year, we had some very unique, four unique things, mm -hmm. right? We had three water main breaks, which has never happened before, not in Montpelier proper, but at <laughs> Union Elementary School, it happens every week, I think in Montpelier, but that influenced one of our buildings and we had a total eclipse of the sun, you know? So that's four events that, um, that I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do one, about one of, that. One of which at least will not happen for next year. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I can guarantee yeah. one will not happen next year. At least, at least not here. <laughs> Jake. Yeah, regarding unique events. Um, so the clips won't happen next year, but um, you know, I think that knowing what we know about the buildings and how they handle heat, um, you know, I wonder if there's a way that we could 
construct the school year better to avoid unexpected cancellations. Like, um, you know, the school year next year starts two days earlier than this year. So, you know, there's a probability that August 28th school might get canceled because of too much heat. Um, and I, I realize also that it's probably already agreed upon, you know, contractually to have the year the way it is. But I think like, can we be smarter about it? And, you know, do we have reason to believe that the water main is going to hold up perfectly next year? Um, I haven't, I haven't heard, you know, that, that the way that they fixed it is a permanent and enduring solution. So like, you know, I, I am very sensitive to unexpected cancellations for parents. And, you know, I feel like there are definitely things that are out of our control, but I wonder if there's ways that we can, you know, adjust the things that are are under our control to make the school year as as configured, you know, strategically as possible. Well, the two so two things about that. One, the the water we can't say it's a singular water main because three different pipes broke that were three different systems this year. They weren't the same pipe. Um, and I think Jake, you asked me that when the second one blew. Um, so. I, I, that's a city question. I don't, I don't know what Andrew's got his theory, theory as to why these particular ones broke, but um, I don't know about that, that piece. The calendar, it's a regional agreement that the, the schools in the region start the Wednesday before Labor Day. Um, that's a regional agreement. In order to, that's not written in stone. There's no statute that says that. That's just the regional agreement as to what day we start. Um, that began two or three years ago. And I don't, the, because of the number of days we have to have, um, the only way to condense the school year out of August and out of June is to not give any breaks throughout the year, just off the top of my head. Like I haven't yeah. tried that calendar obviously, but it would be to take away full week breaks during the school year, at least most of them. Um, because we're talking about usually two to three weeks in August and a, or I'm sorry, two to three weeks in June and a, a week in August. So that's four weeks I would have of instruction I'd have to find or four weeks of school days I'd have to find somewhere, which would happen the, with the February, April, November and December break. So that would mean that we would just go through school straight and I believe we would have a grievance. Not sure, but I think we might have some sort of problem with our union there. Um, I am wondering to Jake's point, this may not be very economical, but like, should we kind of the same way that like we got a bunch of um, air purifiers during COVID, like should, is, should, the, should the district like consider getting some air conditioners to like take the edge off if this does happen? So the challenge, so we did put in for a grant. We work with Jill Briggs Campbell, who's one of our parents at the Agency of Education, who's a marvelous person. Andrew worked with Jill to go after a federal grant to put heat pumps in our, all of our Montpelier buildings. Yeah. It was a million something to ask. I mean, it was expensive yeah. um, and we didn't get that grant. Um, that was two years, a year ago or two years ago that we went after that one. Um, so we know the cost of that. Heat pumps are the most are the most energy efficient, and I'm looking at my board chair because he's the expert in this area. But that's the most energy efficient and right way to go if we were to go there. Roxbury has those, and so they were able to cool their buildings. I, Roxbury stays really cool anyway, regardless. Um, throughout the year, it's really interesting um, in terms of a building. So that didn't have as much effect. Putting in just like. I mean, look at this space right here, putting in an air. Well, first of all, Montpelier High School doesn't have the windows to put in an air conditioner, mm -hmm. like a normal one, because they just have the cracks, yeah. right? So you're talking about another type of unit. To put in a space right here, you'd need what? Six of them, mm -hmm. seven of them, just for this library space. So a classroom with 20 kids, 20 and adolescent kids and, and an adult, <laughs> you know, like it, you're talking about a whole lot of energy consumption. You're talking about a whole lot of money. Yeah. And, and let's be honest, I mean, we're dealing with, we're dealing with some big issues. I mean, like, like climate change, we've got a high school that's in a floodplain, and, and we've got a school year and buildings that were designed for a much cooler climate when it didn't get to be 93 degrees in June, almost ever. And in reverse yeah. that too, 
I've called more ice days in the last three years than I did the first three and that's years. Because we're hovering more at like, yep. you know, 33, 34 degrees instead of like getting into a place where we have like deep winter. So yeah. And, and then, you know, like putting like, why are we going to put heat pumps in this building if we don't know if it's viable? And also yeah. putting heat pumps in middle in the middle, in middle school, school or the elementary school yeah. with super high ceilings, huge windows. Windows that are quite drafty. Yep, yeah, exactly. So it's it's <laughs> yeah. it's tricky. Um, I think that. Oh, go ahead, Jake. I was just going to say that I think that this is big enough and complicated enough that we should add it to the agenda um, for a future meeting. Um, I I I I'm concerned that you know, we're just throwing our, up our hands in the air and saying like, you know, we can't do anything at all. Um, I think there are options. Um, and, you know, I think we should talk about them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't see the situation getting better next year um, or the year after that. So I think we should, we should try to, try to, um, you know, handle this uh, and think about it a little bit more. I mean, I, I, I'm definitely open to that, um, and and I agree. I, I think some of the some of the fixes might be major and expensive to yeah. actually fix fix the problem. Um, yeah. I was just going to say one of the parts of the process that Libby left out because it was more of a informal thing was that she also checked in with Jim and me. Like, what do you think about this? Because it's going to be wicked hot. And I was like, I don't love the idea. <laughs> because I don't love the learning loss or the, the time out of school. Of course, I also understand not a whole lot of learning happens in the last week of school because it's just like, there's just so much excitement. Fun with friends is learning. To, However, yeah, it's true. Not academic and, um, and in retrospect, I think you made the exact right call. Yeah. So I wanted to say that. And I also want to echo. So what Jake is saying about let's take a, 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 broader look at this or a deeper look at this. I'm not quite sure which which one of those it is, but a longer look at this. My feeling here is you made the call you absolutely needed to make, but you made it because it was like like slamming you in the face in the moment. We don't have that right now. So let's let's think about like what are our contingency plans because our infrastructure is not going to get better and the climate crisis is only going to get worse. And so when we have snow days, you have rules that you have to follow for snow days, right? Like maybe it's not statute, but there's like guidelines that you have as to whether or not you call a snow day. Um, I have, they're not written by anybody other than myself, the bus company and the road crews. Right. So there's like, you come up with some sort of plan that yeah. you follow when you're like, oh, uh, weather's on the horizon. I'm just thinking like, and you, you came up with that plan when you weren't staring in the face at a snow day like so since we don't have the crisis right in front of us i think it would be helpful to take a step back and say if it's a water main break can we keep school going like you the you and the, the decided to do and the teachers amazingly executed just a few weeks ago when ues had like all came to the high school probably not ideal but again had to make the decision like in the moment so can we put together some sort of like if it's a water main break or if it's a super hot day what are the things we could do um, kind of plans. This is, I think we're echoing what Kristen has been mentioning a couple of times at other meetings, this sort of like facilities contingency plan with these, these bigger existential issues facing us. So anyway, I just wanted to echo that. Some long-term planning is a good idea. I think we will see some things from the union regarding emergency during oh, negotiations or particularly around things like water mains and th stuff like that and the other, the other thing i'd say too is we made it work that day that it wouldn't have worked if it was raining out because we the kids were outside for the vast majority of the day yeah yeah you yeah know, like it, we can't move 400 kids to another building that's the challenge no i understand inside. you made the and again like in the moment made the right. exact right call you needed to make what i'm saying is that's maybe not the permanent answer but I think if we spent a little bit more time and gave ourselves the like the the space to think about what what could we do instead of cancel school and and, and I would want our teachers union to be at the table for that mm -hmm. conversation and maybe some caregivers to you know but just 
it seems worthwhile when we don't have the crisis facing like right in front of our faces to to think about that. Yeah, no, yeah, I'd like to echo that because I I think you know as I look at this past year and this, this past week, um, and I have no objections to the call, you know, like in, in the circumstances uh, to be clear, but there's emergent issues like a snow day when or a water main, it's like boom, it's happening. Decide. Then there's things like an eclipse and heat that's coming with about, you know, three, four days notice. And those feel different to me. And um, in some ways, I feel it's it's unfair to you, Libby, to kind of send you in there with nothing. Right? Like, and I almost wondered if there's a, a role for maybe to start in the policy committee or something to look at the issue and say, okay, well, when we have, you know, obviously you don't want to get into the middle of an emergent decision that would be nonsense if you want to wake no, up with me and do a snow <laughs> day you're not. welcome Tim Thank it's a morning. barrel That's, of fun that would be terrible <laughs> but but you know you I share your concern about precedent and you know once when you have these things then it becomes easier yeah. for the next thing and the next thing and the next and thing. expected from our union as well and mm -hmm. if you're in there without sort of a clear statement from the board on what we think is an appropriate you know, paradigm based on parental and every and and the staff and everybody's, you know, interests. I think it might be an interesting role for the policy committee to kind of wrestle with that and maybe try and um, try and formulate a different approach and how maybe there's maybe there's the parents, some caregivers are at that table with the union and you know your leadership, um, just to offer that voice and um, and maybe that's helpful and maybe it gets the same decision but folks feel a little bit more included so i i think I me mean, i'm in many ways i feel like i'm saying something similar to you something similar to jake that but i think we could support our leadership a little bit better if we, if we kind of come at it before the emergency gets just really quickly yet. I'm not gonna repeat, but just basically Jake and Mia and 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 Tim have said all really important things about sort of being strategic. We know that increasingly we are gonna have hot days. So this is not something that that is emergent. This is something that we know is gonna be increasing in intensity and frequency. And so it behooves us to be strategic about thinking um how we can um better serve particularly my biggest concern is the equity issue around the families who um don't have part two right so their their child care is, was not taken care of right and so when we close schools early or when we cancel schools that disproportionately impacts um families who who can least um who can least take that impact and so i yeah i i, I want to be able to be mindful that yes in in operational decisions libby made the right decision and going forward what can we do as a board to make sure that the future scenarios um have a better result for a, a wider swath of our community um and so yeah I, I very much think that that we need to be thinking about particularly around heat certainly water main breaks are are not predictable um but but hot days are um, and so this is something that we need to be thinking about um, going forward. This is the you, Taylor Swift, and the president scenario that you're needing to solve what is so much more about the responsibility of our community. So the other thing I thought about a lot today is like, we should do something, but our budget didn't pass the first time. We had to close an entire school to get the budget passed. So we're sort of stuck in this really challenging situation where we are continuing to literally get floods and pandemics and heat waves. And yet we're kind of paralyzed by resources to actually do anything differently. So, and, and it wouldn't be the union be at the table. Like I do think, I think that's like a reality. They will, they will have some suggestions on this. They, and that all those pieces that folks were having trouble with are all negotiated. So I actually think very little of this is in your control. <laughs> um, and I'm just feeling very like sort of this is again why we need to have these like it's scary but like really big conversations about like merging and moving and because yeah. this is not going to go away and yet I also don't think we would 
get a million dollar bond pass to put mini splits into this building. So what can be done? Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I also, our, our entire community needs to support childcare and needs to support families who can't take time off and needs to support investing to keep our schools funded and safe. And so I guess this is sort of my plea to the larger community <laughs> that it's really easy to just say, fix this, fix this, fix this, fix this, fix this. But if we can't get our budget passed without making some serious cuts, I just think we're, we're not gonna be able to yeah. get. The big joke today was, Libby, can you just fix climate change today, please? Mm -hmm. uh, can you just fix this for us? <laughs> that was a big joke today. No, I, I agree, John. I don't wanna minimize some of the things we may be able to do to, to get ahead of some of these things. But at, at the end of the day, when, when, when conditions make our buildings not habitable, it, it takes a big resource investment to make them habitable. And, and we can do better things about planning for childcare and, and we can work with the union. But you know, if we're gonna have close to hundred degree temperatures in our, I mean, you, you, have, you have to air condition mm -hmm. to, to have people be able to function. And that, that is not gonna come from us talking. That's, that's gonna come from the community changing how we resource our, our institutions. Yeah, yeah, I just, that. As much as I would love Libby to fix climate change, um, <laughs> I'm going to climate activist, please. Yeah. 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 That's my summer planning. Great. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a much bigger and more like systemic problem than just how Libby makes the decision about whether or not to close school. Um, and I guess like if community conversations are gonna make people feel better about it, we can do that. But I don't, I just think it's a bigger question than just the policy back. Yeah, and it's everything, it's childcare too. I mean, like our, our primary question should be, can we safely and effectively educate our kids in the building and, and we have the reality of like, what are kids gonna do about childcare? Yeah. And which should be, which should, should, should not be on schools, but it is. Um, we will talk about this more. <laughs> uh, Cause it is, is very important. have air conditioning. I mean, I don't, I'm just- You don't. Uh, <laughs> no. The new CDCC building will. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, a, a, a new high school if we built one would. Um, oh, Jim, Alara. Alara. Um, you could start like an MHS, like babysitters club and have high school students offer I've thought of that too. I'm talking about. I love yeah. this. I mean, it was kind of a joke in my head, but then I was like, wait, that could actually work. And then maybe like a small stipend or just like CDL, or, CDL or like yeah. volunteer hours for like college applications. If, if I had another that. year here, I'd <laughs> look into it. <laughs> Tell them Annie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very urgent. Um, approve the C9 uh, Child Nutrition Act Wellness Policy Monitor Report. Do I have a motion to approve that? So moved. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, and before we adjourn, two things. One, congrats to all of the various uh, graduations and promotions. We had um, a wonderful ceremony at the high school. Uh, we had a very nice ceremony at middle school. Those are the two I saw. I'm assuming UES RVS also went very well on the promotion day up. Uh, Alara gave a fabulous speech at the high school graduation. Um, thank you for doing that. And then, this is Alara's last, uh, last board meeting. Uh, so thank you for all of your amazing work. Um, I know Scott has something for you, I believe. Oh, Scott had something the, for you. The board. Yes. Um, thank you. Yeah, but. Um, wilting in the seat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your t-shirt is making it yeah. easy for me to remember yes. your next yes. step. Yes. Uh, but. Um, Thank you for all the work. You have been such a thoughtful and um, helpful board member. We've really appreciated all of the input you've given and your insights. Uh, it's, it's been fantastic having you. Um, I know you will will have 
uh, an amazing time at Smith, and I know you will go on to do great things. We're really happy to be a stop on your journey. So thank you. <laughs> great. And uh, do you have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Do you have a second? No. <laughs> I'll second. Our brains aren't working. All, it's all those in favor. I'm going to abstain. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll just we'll find you. We'll find you here at the next meeting in August. All right. Thanks, everyone.